With new information, we need to stay up to date on how to take care of our reptiles. And with that said, let's go over some really old HowCast care guides and discuss if they're still valid or if we should be using care guides from that era in time. My name's Adam, this is Diamond. You're watching Wicked Smoking Reptiles. Stick around. So we don't really do these, but we've got a computer here. We're gonna go through a care guide or a couple of them anyway, and uh, discuss like, should we use these anymore? What's my reaction to them? And in general, I know you probably came here for a little bit of drama. You're probably not gonna get it because although I've not watched these since forever ago when they were first made probably, I actually kind of like Jungle Bob and the way that he presents information. And I think most of it was pretty accurate back in the day. But with that said, how many times have you watched a movie and thought, this is horrific. How did children ever watch this? So I don't know, maybe it's not as good as I remember. So with that said, let's just start this one's eight care tips for bearded dragons. So not a true care guide, but it's like three minutes. So good job, Howcasts. Nice digestible size. I wish I could make videos like that and the algorithm wouldn't hate me for it. Let's just start it off. <laughs> The number one pet lizard in the world is certainly the bearded dragon. This is a phenomenon that started about 25 years ago when these animals were imported from their native country of Australia. Okay, so this video is from uh, eight years ago. So let's call it like 2012, 25 years before. So that's pretty accurate. It's kind of interesting because it's like bang, bang. Number one uh, lizard in the world, which is true as far as I could tell, or probably was at the time anyway. Uh, and then just kind of like talks about how you can't import them anymore, which I imagine he's going to allude to and move on with. They're all captive bred and captive bored and therefore better pets than other things like Chinese water dragons. Very soon we found that they were bred readily in captivity and now you'll never see an animal in the in the US marketplace, the pet marketplace that comes from Australia. Their ancestors did. They are bred in captivity. So that's interesting. I think what he means is you'll never see a bearded dragon come from Australia, like exported out. He said animal, but I know what you mean, Bob. Anyway, if you're watching this, like there are still some exports from Australia, but it's really, really rare. So anyway. And bred readily. And the reason for their popularity is twofold, really. Number one, the bottom one here is pretty much an adult. 18 inches is where they max out. But they come from a very dry habitat. Here's another thing too. So I get a lot of like, hey, you said that they get up to 200 pounds, but I saw one that was 202 pounds, like if I'm talking about retics or something. And I always say that bearded dragons, they top out around, uh, 18 to 24 inches because that's true. So I actually kind of like this style better because he's, although he's kind of not right in that they don't always top out at 18 inches, who cares? I mean, he's just trying to tell you what your average is gonna be. If you're getting a bearded dragon, what is it going to be likely? So I actually kind of like this better. I can't do that because I'll get crucified in the comment section, but that's a better way to present it in my opinion almost desert-like. They live on sand. So anybody who's ever kept a tropical lizard like an iguana knows what a mess it can be when they do their business. Where a bearded dragon uses the bathroom, he does it in a tank where there's sand and heat lamps, and it's extremely easier to pick that up than it is some Bob, you're not supposed to keep them on just sand. Well, actually, I mean, if you look we okay this was before we had uh heroes of the world like dave kaufman going to australia and looking um it would have helped if you actually made it right it's got a poo in it at the actual substrate for bearded dragons i'm gonna break your heart uh the substrate in the wild for bearded dragons is not paper towel or slate so i mean loose substrate is a thing maybe that's what he meant but I wouldn't recommend just sand as a substrate and mix it up so that uh, it is a little bit more naturalistic because they're gonna be on like a compact clay with stones and sand and like a sandy soil mix out in the wild. So, I mean, whatever, this is eight years ago when the only thing that was really available was like a Kelsey sand and we talked last week about why that's garbage. Something it's tropical in a wet environment. So he's very hygienic. But really the number one reason for their popularity is they are extremely friendly creatures. Nothing you see before you here is a trained animal. This is just the nature of them. 
We have customers in our store that come in this time of the year, summertime. They have them on their shoulders. They have them under their hats, under their jackets, and they walk. Around. Uh, well, that's an interesting thing to, I would never recommend, like, I'm kind of nitpicking because this video is actually pretty good. This video is pretty good. Uh, I wouldn't recommend just going to a store with a bearded dragon under your hat or under, if it's under your jacket, it's probably too cold for them anyway. But don't bring bearded dragons into a reptile shop unless they say it's okay. Most reptile shops, if they're worth their salt, aren't gonna want you just to be bringing in animals all willy-nilly because they don't know what your animal has. So other than that, doing good, Bob. Do I like how it's some idiot behind a camera who's not a professional, uh, I think this guy's a scientist, telling a professional scientist, hey, you're doing a good job. Like, who am I? around with them. We just recently created, as a matter of fact, a, a, a carry bag called a beardy bag that we produce here to carry your bearded dragon with you wherever you go, to the supermarket, to the shopping center, in the movies, people keep their dragons with them. It's got a wow factor because it looks kind of dinosaur-like, but really all those little appendages and, and uh, spikes on the side of them are, are not there for anything but to stop an animal from biting it and swallowing it if it was out in nature. So it really is not as rough looking as it seems. They are- It's a good point. Cause I remember when I first started looking into bearded dragons and I got my first one, I always thought like, well, I don't wanna, cause I, I figured like, I remember catching perch when I was a kid, right? And then the, the spikes on the dorsal fin would like get into you and it would hurt and sting, right? So I thought, okay, well it's gonna be the same thing with a bearded dragon, but here, come here. So we can like demonstrate kind of like Bob, you know? And uh, it's so true. Cause like they feel, like, I guess if you really stuck your hand in there, but when you touch them, they're not, I don't know, they're not spiky like that. Even these ones, you can go back and forth. Um, but yeah, it's a good, uh, I, I like it. I think that this video is kind of geared towards people who maybe have never touched a bearded dragon before, or really thinking about one. So I like it. I think this is good so far. Omnivorous in their diet, so they're easy to keep. Any type of insects, crickets, worms, etc., they'll gobble up, and they love their greens. So moms love bearded dragons because they encourage salad eating throughout the family. The bearded dragon has supplanted and taken the place of the, igu the green iguana that for decades dominated the industry. Green iguanas are a difficult animal to keep in comparison to these, and we really promote the use of bearded dragons as a pet for a child. These are Bang on. That's such a great way to put it too, because iguanas suck as pets for most people. Like, you're gonna be thousands of dollars in building an enclosure for uh, an iguana. Where with these guys, just go to the cages link in the description below, press add to cart and check out, and use code WWR and get a discount. But what I'm trying to say here is, you can go to any online retailer or pet store or whatever and buy 120 gallon, a four by two by two, something like that for a bearded dragon, where with an iguana, you can't, so. I mean, this is just like a weird roundabout way to say stuff that I've already preached, probably because I got the idea from this video in the first place 10 years ago or whenever it was. Are excellent. They come now in a variety of colors. In their native land, they would be more sand colored, but through captive and selective breeding, we see yellow, orange, and red dragons that are striking in color and just make the tremendous companion. We call them study buddies here. We call them lap lizards. It's cool because I think he's like really, try this was a time when there was a big transition uh, between getting the information from a pet store or from a breeder and a breeder or a pet store is going to give you information based on what they have available and what they can sell to you. Where Bob here obviously doesn't have a dog in the fight. He isn't really promoting anything except for the beardy bag, which I checked doesn't even have a link in the description. So I think it's a transition point in time where he's trying to give you the best information. He seems like, I don't actually know what this guy's credentials are, but he's wearing one of those hats that only someone who's really educated and doesn't care the way that they look would actually wear. So I've got to think the guy is legit. Like why else would you dress like that, you know? But uh, Bob, either way, I think this is a really great message. Um, you know, it's a study buddy, they eat salads, whatever. It's kind of geared towards either kids or probably parents of kids who are looking to get their first uh, reptile, which is what a lot of the videos that I make are for or geared towards. And again, this is like probably an influence that I never talk about because it was just a subliminal influence because I have definitely watched this video in the past now that I think about it, we got like 10 seconds left. Let's round it out. We call them anything we want as far as to show people they are fantastic companion animals. The bearded dragon, easy to keep, never gonna bite you, and long lives 15, 20 years.
Now, normally you hear me talk about like, I don't like when people speak in absolutes. Um, and when it's something like, it's never gonna bite you, I think that like he's doing it and he's tapping its nose and stuff. And I do that with Diamond. And I think that's good because you're instilling confidence. Um, and I guess if you probably talked to him and you asked him, he would concede that they can definitely bite you, but it's just really uncommon for that to happen. So I don't actually have a problem with speaking in absolutes in that context. When I hear channels talk about how uh, you absolutely must have UVB even for all snakes, otherwise they'll get meta, like that I don't like because it's a science-based thing without a any actual science. Where with this, he's speaking in generalities and broad terms and it's just instilling confidence in you. So let's watch one more about a different species and see how that went. All right, so we've got one from uh, 2013. So we're going on eight years old. I don't think it's that long ago, but again, <laughs> 2013 is the transition period. This is when you're filming videos in 720 if you have a good camera. I remember filming videos in like 360p. That was like a standard thing in 2011. So this is only a few years removed to that. There's not really a lot of uh, YouTubers. Iridocyclitis. Talking about reptiles at all. Barchuk might have started at this point, maybe. He did, because he started in 2008. But there's really nothing else available. So anyway, that's my long-winded way to say, let's see how this two minute video pans out. Ball pythons are probably one of your more docile pythons and a very good pet to have. All right, let's take one step back here. So this guy is an actual doctor. Uh, when I see doctor, like the guy's name like, is a doctor or whatever, I just assume the guy's a doctor. So let's assume that Dr. Mark Magazoo is a doc. It actually says what he is right here. Reading is hard. So he's the chairman of St. Francis Veterinary Center. I imagine he's probably got to be a vet to be chairman. Pythons of and a very good pet to have. As you can see, this little guy is balling up a little bit. They're called ball pythons because for protection, if he was really afraid, he'd completely ball and hide his head in the middle against predators. That's where they get their name, the ball python. They don't get very large, normally between three to five, seven feet at the longest. Well, I wanna see the seven foot ball python, their uh, doctor, but otherwise, I mean, I'm trying to be critical when I really can't. Like, th these videos are actually put together very well. A lot of the time, especially now, because I think the market's more saturated, you'd see videos like this, where it's like a big company and a big production, and they'll be uh, flamboyant with the statistics and be like, oh, there was a record of one that my grandma's mother's dog's son saw, and it was like 12 feet or whatever. Where with this, he's just kind of like up to seven feet, and he He's probably talking about the Voltas, which are um, a locality from a, uh, in Africa where they're from, where they do get really big. But either way, I mean, it's called a ball python because of this. I thought they were called ball pythons because uh, LeVar Ball saw one balling out and uh, shooting three free throws. But ball pythons are called ball pythons because they're really good at basketball. In their native range of West Africa, a researcher found one and said, wow, that noodle can really ball out. That researcher's name, LeVar Ball. Apparently not. And um, then uh, other, other than that, like the size thing, which is like very broad. So good job, doc. They are long lived though. They'll live up to 40 years. So be ready to take care of this guy for a long time. They're carnivorous, they're constrictors. A guy this size will eat mice and rats. You start them off when they're younger with pinkies. The way that you can figure out how much to feed these guys is measure the girth of the largest part of their body and their bait should never be larger than that. That's a good way of gauging. Yeah, like I really tried to d make this more clickbaity than it is, but like this is just good information. It's crazy how we all do these 15 minute, 20 minute, 30 minute. I saw a leopard gecko care guide that was over an hour, just cause animal friends. And I think realistically, it's cool to do videos like that. And I'm guilty of making really long ones, but this is like a great introduction. So when I do top five videos, this is what I'm trying to do times five animals. Just a very quick, this is kind of like the basics of it because this guy would tell you, anyone would tell you, you can't watch this and then be like, oh, well, I know how to take care of a ball python. Now I'm gonna go get, like, that's not the idea. So I think these guys are like breaking down what a top five video is before top five videos were top five videos. Kind of, okay, let's move on. They require a terrarium that has a heat gradient from the low 90s to the low to mid 80s. 
they require a little bit more humidity than some of our other snakes. So their humidity should be in the 70 to 80 percent. So here's why this is like important and I decided to stop here. Uh, back in the day, humidity wasn't something that was talked about basically at all. I remember in 2010 talking to a ball python expert who was saying to keep them right around the humidity of your house in a 20 gallon enclosure. So this person was out so far out to lunch they couldn't find the office, you know what I mean? Uh, but I think this is really cool because even though this is a dated care guide, it's a little bit older, just on the cusp of uh, old versus more modern. This is really important because I think, especially in this time frame in uh, life, like this time, this point in the world, people weren't really talking about the humidity being that elevated for ball pythons. And that's why you uh, had things like shedding issues, uh, wouldn't eat their food, things like that. So this is awesome. They're a shy snake. And it's very important that they have a proper hiding area. Now you can create a hide box with a regular cardboard box, a pot for a plant, and it should be just big enough that it surrounds this little fella, makes him comfortable. You can have a Yeah, so the, I mean, I, I'm really trying to nitpick here. Don't use a cardboard box. A cardboard box in a humidity level that's 80%, 70% is going to mold. It's gonna get m rusty, m rusty. Paper doesn't rust. It's gonna get musty, it's gonna get soaked, it's gonna be limp, it's gonna be torn apart, it's gonna mold. Don't do that, but he is right. Like, otherwise I can't. All right, okay, let's continue. Guy who actually trained to do this for a living. A hole in the top or the side that they can crawl in. And also it's very important that they have an area that they can bathe in. So having a basin with water, the water should be just deep enough to cover the snake. This helps with them going to the bathroom. It helps with their digestive system. It'll help with them shedding. And it also will help keep the terrarium human. So it's interesting. It's called How to Care for a Ball Python Pet Snakes. But it's not really a full care guide. And I don't think it was meant to be that. I don't think it's masquerading uh, to, to be that. So I think this guy did a really good job, even though I don't know if he's a professional presenter or not. He's a chairman of a board, so he probably speaks in front of groups. But this is, I mean, I wish I could do two minute videos like this. The algorithm doesn't like it, right? Which is why, although this is an 8 million subscriber channel, the the views on these aren't as big as like uh, bigger YouTubers for reptiles. So uh, ov overall, I'm sure you came here for me to tear these apart. How dare you say this? And if you want, I can rip apart some really bad ones. Leave a comment, leave a like, uh, if you want me to rip apart some like really bad ones, cause there are, but these are not them. These are great. These are one of the better series uh, on reptiles. So just because it's not, you know, so-and-so's exotic, so-and-so's reptiles, you know, with a million plus subscribers just talking about reptiles, this is viable. This is as good as any information on the internet. And that's it. This was kind of a weirder video. I don't think it was what I expected it to be. Was it what you expected it to be? Let me know in the comment section below. I'd really love to know. A special thank you as always to the Patreon supporters. You guys are freaking amazing. Um, you guys get videos like this early. You get you know extra content. Um, uh, the videos that are coming out, you guys get to see those early. All that and more for as little as a dollar a month. And uh, I think that's it. So I do videos twice a week. That means I'll see you on Monday. Showtime. Showtime for you.